Good evening and welcome to the graduating ceremony for the class of 2020 at Westside Christian High School. My name is John Hines. I'm your new head of school. And I want to extend a special welcome to you parents out there who uh, have toiled for four years. Uh, you've committed your time, uh, your resources, your treasure to this facility and this school. And we very much appreciate that. I want to welcome the esteemed board members who are here this afternoon. And of course, all of you faculty members who have been alongside these kids these four years. I did not have the pleasure of serving as your head of school, but I have the pleasure of serving as the first um, head of school for you as alumni. And so my very first alumni class is a class of 2020. And so I welcome you and I ask for you to uh, be blessed on your journey. Let's open with a word of prayer. If you would bow your head with me, please. Father, these are unusual circumstances to be having a ceremony, and yet we know that you are the Lord of all, that you, God, saw this without any concern. You knew this was coming. You knew exactly what this was going to look like this day. Father, we place all of our trust in you. We place these graduates in your hands. Father, we have helped them see not to become part of this world we ask them, we ask, Lord, that you would just be along, be, take this journey with them as they go forward so that they, they, they might not conform to the world in their thoughts. They might not be part of things that uh, we have taught them, Father, are of you and for you. Go forth, graduates, and bless this afternoon as we celebrate together in your love. In, amen. Thank you. can breathe now. Okay. So your motto has been love in action. And that's been kind of a hard thing to do the last part of this year, I'm sure. But the verse, I think, has helped me at least, and as I'm sure you, process that motto uh, a, a bit better. And I want to talk you, to you about the context real quick, which I think is important. The context of your class versus transformation. And one can't practice love in action, which is Romans 12, 9 through 13, unless there has been transformation. So let me read to you just the first two verses of the chapter. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our prayer has been that there would be this inner transformation so that you would love well. That said, here are the verses that you have selected. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. In Jesus' name, amen.
hello, Westside class of 2020, family, and friends. Isn't it so great to be known as a resilient generation during these unprecedented times? Ugh, aren't you guys so sick of hearing that? I know I am. In all honesty, I, like many of you, thought I would be giving this speech to you in person, that I could look out and see all of our smiling faces, dressed in our caps and gowns, excited to take this next step as a class and graduate from Westside. We started our senior year making memories at senior retreat, picking our class motto, love in action. We ended our year getting that dreaded email that we would be continuing our remote learning for the remainder of the school year and that the senior year, which we had imagined, was no more. It is true, we did not finish the race like we had wanted, but that may not be the worst thing. Think of all those Olympic athletes who trained their whole lives for one race and lose by three seconds. But if you think about it, those athletes were probably just happy to be at the Olympics. They made it that far. That is worth celebrating. This scenario applies to us today. We may not have finished, um, our senior year like we had planned, but we're still here at graduation, taking that next step together. The next question that has to be asked is what do those Olympic athletes hold on to after they finish their race? They hold on to the training and the hours of blood, sweat, and tears that it took them to get there. So, Westside Class of 2020, what is our training? What can we take away from our time here at Westside? It is the memories and moments that we have shared together. These are what we need to hold on to. From freshman year, surviving our first day, learning to navigate those two hallways, and adjusting to being in high school. Then, it was off to sophomore year, where, well, I think you can all agree, nothing really happened sophomore year. Some of us were granted driver's license by the state of Oregon, but really, that's pretty much it. Then, junior year, with the dreaded term paper, where, yeah, I got time, I'll get it done, quickly turned into, how much sleep did you get last night? Then, in a blink of an eye, it was our senior year. A lot has happened in these last four years, and I urge you not to forget our time here at Westside. The memories we have made are truly what unite us as a class and cannot be taken away. Westside will always hold a special place in our hearts. It is here where some of us have met our closest friends, have discovered our passions, have grown in our faith in Christ. We, of course, could not have made it here without the help of some of these great teachers of ours. To our teachers, Thank you for coming to work every day and always putting your students first. Many of you have influenced what direction our lives will be heading. I would bet that if you asked any of us future science majors if there was a teacher who influenced our decision, most of us would say that we had this high school science teacher who made science come to life and would teach with such passion, who could describe such complicated scientific procedures in ways anyone can understand. Those future math majors will remember their crazy math teacher in high school who had a yodeling pickle, would stand on chairs and say, this is really important, and who would put that infamous joke on our TPFs. What did the acorn say when he grew up? <laughs> Gee, I'm a tree. <laughs> Those studying history will remember their time in class with Mrs. Rose and Mr. Wright, who were so passionate about the subjects they were teaching. Students studying government or economics will remember class with Mr. Wright and never forget those unintended consequences. The literature majors will remember all the interesting conversations we had with TAG during our Socratic seminars. The hopeful bilinguals will remember all of the fun parties during their foreign language classes and playing all of those fun games. Those wanting to study theology or continue to learn about the Christian walk will remember the lessons we have taken from our Bible teachers, Mr. Flores and Ms. Mr. Lindsley. The musically gifted will remember their time with Mr. Fox, the dramatic, their time with Tag at Alpenrose during that crazy tech week. Our teachers taught us not only book knowledge, but a lot of important life lessons as well. To work hard, to never settle, and to always do your best. Thank you teachers for everything you have taught us these past four years. We have learned a lot in high school. Never use Wikipedia as a source. Never end an essay with inconclusion. What the quadratic formula is. We have also learned some other things that we weren't expecting. To not go to Burgerville for off-campus lunch, because if you get stuck at one of those lights, you are toast. We learned how to put up the lunch tables during lunch duty. We also became novice computer hackers, trying to get past those block sites on our Chromebooks. Class of 2020, I urge you not to forget the memories we have made together these last four years. Because we were blessed with a small class, we were able to have deeper connections with our fellow classmates and grow closer together. Our memories are unique to each of us. They truly are the ones that we will remember for the rest of our lives. 
Westside is a common bond linking those memories. We could not have picked a better class motto to follow this year. Only God could have known that love in action not only reflects what is needed today, but will be a guiding force for all of us to follow throughout our lives. I, of course, would not be standing here today if it wasn't for some great people. To my parents, thank you for always believing in me and being supportive. To my mom, thank you for all the many drives to school through the carpool line at West Hills to dropping me off on my first day at freshman year. To my dad, <laughs> thank you for driving all over Oregon to be at every cross country meet, basketball game, track meet. It meant the world to me to know that my dad was there to cheer me on. To my friends, I'm going to miss our unconventional conversations at the lunch table and running to make it to class after our first off-campus lunch. Thank you for laughing at all my dumb jokes and always being an encouragement, encouragement to me. I'm going to miss you guys so much next year. To my teachers, thank you for all that you have taught me over these last four years. I could not have made it here without all of your willingness to answer my questions and offer me help when I needed it. To my coaches, Mr. Ball, I will always remember all of your wonderful pieces of advice to keep putting your back foot in front of your front foot and the rest will take care of itself. <laughs> I am very excited for all the new things I can do now that I have my high school diploma. To my basketball coach, Coach Hodge, thank you for making senior year one that I will never forget. And to my throwing coach, Mr. Brooks, we have known each other a long time and I am so grateful for the lessons you taught me, that the world belongs to those who show up. This lesson will stay with me for the rest of my life, and I'm really going to miss you next spring. Finally, to my class, thank you for making my time here at Westside one that I will always look back on with great memories and a joyful heart. You guys have made these last four years the best ones of my life. You know, you could say this year was pretty crappy, but hey, at least we all had enough toilet paper. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Grace Vermillion, one of your valedictorians. I dearly miss all of my friends and teachers, and I'm honored to be able to share with you today. I have loved my high school experience at Westside, despite how the last four months of it turned out. Westside is a place where I've grown immensely, and I have made memories and friendships here that will last a lifetime. Part of me can't believe it's already over, and that the next time I walk past Mrs. Moyer's desk, I'll have to stop and get a visitor's name tag. But part of me is also so ready for what's ahead of me in life, and I'm sure some of my classmates feel the same way. Today, I would like to share with you from Matthew and what my prayer is for my classmates as we head out into the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives, life, it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. When I think of Westside, I've always had the picture of a city on a hill. We are quite literally looking over out over 99, but I also believe we are a light that should not be hidden. There is something special that takes place within the walls of Westside Christian. We have a community that cares about the people within it, and teachers that care about the students and how we are doing beyond the classroom. Everyone is in a different place in their faith journey, but there are people here that are genuinely seeking God and desire to have a life that honors Him, and they inspire and encourage me in, to do the same, because iron sharpens iron. We are not called to stay in our Christian circles, however, but to go out and impact the world and bring Jesus' light to those who surround us. Some ways I have seen that at Westside are through sportsmanship-like conduct at sporting events. After cross-country, or track races, I always see Davis and Alvin congratulating their competitors who took first and last place. Before every hurdle race last track season, the other hurdler from Westside and I would always stop and pray before we got in our blocks to calm our nerves and pray for a safe race for ourselves and our competitors. That led to the finals race at districts where almost every girl joined us for our pre-race prayer. One of the choir's main goals is to inspire others and glorify God through our singing. And one of the moments that touched me the most and made me realize the power that our voices carry was after the state championships last year, when a girl from a competing choir who was going through a rough time in life reached out to Mr. Fox in an email sharing the impact of our performance on her. 
This is part of what she said. Your choir may have been performing for a trophy today, but for me, your choir was simply sharing the love of Christ. While my classmates around me in an auditorium were trying to rile me up with ultra competitiveness and desire for your choir to mess up, so maybe, just maybe, we would have a shot at a trophy, um, I felt God's love in that room. There was healing in your music, so I couldn't be happier that you were the state champions because Westside Christian Choir was worshiping and giving the glory to God. You have my endless gratitude. Please, never stop making music that glorifies Jesus. That is why we make music. The choir practices all year long, and yes, part of our goal is to win the state championship, but for me, that email had a bigger impact on me than taking home another championship trophy ever could. There are, these are examples of what Westside being a light looks like. But what could it look like once we step out of Westside? The Beatitudes, which Jesus talks about just before he calls us to be the light in the Sermon on the Mount, are a great example of what this looks like. The Beatitudes say, it looks like someone who hungers for righteousness, is merciful, pure in heart, and a peacemaker. This is what continuing our class, this looks, this looks like continuing our class motto of love and action. This looks like standing up for justice and truth in our world or on our college campuses. Forgiving a friend who has hurt you, seeing the needs of the hurting and meeting them if you have the ability to do so. We are the light of the world and we must let our light shine. This is not an easy task. It's pretty countercultural in this dark world. But as we leave Westside, I challenge you to do just that. Helen Keller once said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. So go out and live your daring adventure of following Jesus Christ. And in this dark world, be a light. Thank you.
fellow classmates, faculty, staff, family, friends, and loved ones. My name is Deanna Brooker and it's an honor to speak to you today. While I certainly miss seeing all of your faces, getting to graduate together physically, I am grateful for the opportunity that we do have. To our parents and families, thank you for supporting us throughout high school. Certainly through paying our tuition, but also by supporting us at our sporting events, concerts and productions, driving us as far as Eugene and Taft and volunteering to make our school functions possible. To the faculty and staff, thank you for investing in us academically, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, providing us with a foundation to succeed in college and beyond. To my classmates, I appreciate the dedication and curiosity shown in each one of you. For some of you, it was a curiosity for science or literature, but for others, I have seen curiosities for music or cars or sports or cosmetology and everything in between. Continue in curiosity and diligently pursue those interests. In these past few months, as senior year looked quite differently than what we anticipated, I respect the perseverance and fortitude that was demonstrated. We made it through online calculus and physics and choir, all classes which are certainly easier in person, but we did it. In the absence of scheduled end of year events, uh, individual students set up groups and calls and STUCO found ways to hang out from our individual homes. We innovated to best use the situation that we're in our first year of college won't be typical, and undoubtedly life after that will continue to surprise us. But continue in perseverance and innovation, continue to enjoy that through any circumstance, you can understand what will last. Next, I admire the humility and love that I've seen from this class. At the beginning of the year, we decided that love and action would be our motto. And I saw that motto being lived out daily. I love that all Westside students were valued and an effort was made to welcome and invest in each one. I love the service, hospitality, and respect shown at Metzger Elementary, at Night Strike, at With Love, at away basketball games, and at choir competitions. Finally, I love the intentionality that was demonstrated by this class. I love how purposeful in relationships and goals you were. As we move forward, let each stage of life be marked with intentionality. Ask, for what purpose do I act on a daily basis? Let us determine our reasons that we may live effectively, holding ourselves accountable and reminding ourselves why and for whom we act. Westside Christian High School Class of 2020. Continuing curiosity and diligence and humility and purpose and most importantly in love. Thank you. Hello class of 2020. First off, I'd just like to say a couple thank yous. And as I do this, I encourage you guys to also reflect on who's been in your life and who's helped you get to this point. Uh, the people that have nurtured you, loved you, and cared for you. Uh, so first off, I'd like to thank my parents. Uh, my mom and bath, thank you just for teaching me how to be caring to others. Thank you for showing me just how to find joy in the simple things and just living out that example of resilience and hard work. Um, and yeah, both of you guys immigrated from Vietnam at a very young age. Uh, hoping to get a better life in America, and happy to say that I think we did find that. Um, next, I'd like to thank all the staff at Westside. I'd like to thank uh, the teachers and choir directors and uh, coaches and mentors and staff and everyone that makes Westside what it is. Um, you guys all, in some way, have shaped my Westside experience, and even as I go out now with my class, you guys will continue to be here and continue living out uh, that mission that Westside has of really equipping uh, just strong Christian leaders in the world. Um, next, I'd like to thank all my classmates. Uh, it's crazy to think, but since uh, from the seniors that were here while I was a freshman to now the freshmen that are here, I'm a senior. That's seven years of people that have come into my life and influenced me in some way. And there's just so many memories there. There's so many fun times, really uh, just powerful conversations. And I'll always treasure those moments. And you guys have all helped make these some of the best years of my life. Um, but yeah, lastly, I'd just like to thank God for his provision and providing for me such a great family and friends and community and just all the opportunities I've been, I've been given. Just, uh, I just want to give God the glory for that. And I also want to just say that I'm really grateful that we serve a God who we can rely on during these uncertain times because I was reflecting on how things are now and what I decided to do was send out a survey to my classmates just asking 
how are you feeling? Like what word or phrase describes your emotions right now uh, towards the fall and the future? And there's a lot of different answers. There's excited, nervous, um, a big bra moment is what someone said, which basically translation for that is like an are you kidding me type of thing. Um, unsure, unprepared, couldn't come sooner, uh, nervous sided, which is nervous and excited. Um, but yeah, just a lot of different emotions. And I challenge you guys as you reflect on the future and your goals for the future, that you just take a listen to this quote. It's by Francis Chan, one of my favorite speakers. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Because we're all pursuing something, whether it's you know money or uh, something we don't even know what we're pursuing, right? We just follow along the path that society has kind of set out for us. Um, so I encourage you guys to just think about what you are pursuing through what you're doing. Because we're going to college, we're going to gap years, we're doing work, we're doing online college, sadly. Um, but you know, wherever we're at, just think about what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, and what are you pursuing through that? And is it lasting? Is it God honoring? Is it something that is meaningful to you and that you can look back on and really I just say, wow, I did that, you know. Um, so yeah, I encourage you guys to just think through that. As I was reflecting on the Val Victorian speech and what it means to me and to everyone else, um, I was talking with Peter and we were saying, oh, there's, you know, these two like types of speeches, you will, like these two tropes people use, which is like the memory speech, like, oh, remember that? That was funny. Or like looking towards the future speech where you're like, oh, you can do anything. The world's your oyster. You're going to college and you're going to get a PhD and have no troubles and make half a million dollars, right? Um, but, you know, in reality, um, it's not always true. <laughs> but I was thinking about, like, just, man, like, is there anything I knew I can really say? Is there anything I can bring to the table? And I was just thinking, like, I mean, not really, right? Everything has been said. Like, the things I'm saying now, they're in some way or shape, like, encouragements and reflections of the past and looking towards the future, right? Um, but what I realized with the Val Victorian speech is why it's meaningful is because right here, right now, I'm standing and celebrating this moment with all you guys as a class and what we did and what we accomplished. And it doesn't need to be something groundbreaking that I'm going to say, because every year when a Val Victorian gives his speech or her speech, the reason why it's meaningful is because they rep represent their class in that way. And it's a really honoring thing to be a part of. And yeah, like I could give a speech about ketchup, but it could be the greatest speech in the world, right? But it has no meaning, because this is our graduation. And I want you guys to realize that even though we've been through this pandemic, right, and I don't want this to be like the pandemic uh, COVID-19 speech, but sadly, you know, looking back, it's always going to be, oh, hey, remember, there's COVID-19 during that time, right? Um, but looking forward from that, I think I want to just tell you guys that this in no way has undermined your accomplishments, what this pandemic has done. If anything, I would say it's uh, showed just your further resilience and determination to tough it out and tough it on through all the online school, right, just to get our diploma. And I'm really proud of all you guys and just how as a class we really bonded over this past year, especially with senior retreat and everything. And, you know, we obviously wish we could have had that final retreat, but I know we'll all stay in touch, hopefully. And I'm really looking forward to that 10-year reunion, right, Claire? I'm looking forward to you playing that. <laughs> but, yeah, lastly, I'd just like to leave you guys off with a couple words of encouragement and a challenge. Um, just to stay rooted in your faith and your beliefs, to keep pursuing the meaningful things in life and to not forget to have some fun along the way. Uh, so class 2020, we did it. Congratulations. God bless. I think most of us would agree that one of the best parts of school is just being around your friends. And Westside has certainly been an excellent place to make friends and to both invest in and be invested in by other people. My friend Gabe and I have a song to share with you in just a little bit um, that has quite a lot to do with the topic of friendship. And I hope that while you listen, um, it'll bring a few things to your mind. First, I hope you'll think of the many friends you've enjoyed at Westside and some of your favorite memories with them. Thank you all for being such good friends to me. Second, I hope you'll think of the many new people that you're undoubtedly going to meet um, and the friends that you have yet to make by choosing to love people earnestly and letting them invest in you in return. And finally, I hope you'll be reminded of Jesus, your steadfast and best friend. More than just an all-powerful God, he's a personal God too. And I pray that you continue to pursue friendship with Jesus and that it would be a comfort and an encouragement to you whenever you're in need. So without further ado, you've got a friend in me. Thank you. 
I was really looking forward to uh, seeing you all in your cap and gowns and looking you at the, in the face. Um, and obviously that's not where we're at now. And over the last few months is we've been doing a lot of things by distance. We've been uh, doing classes by distance, church uh, by distance, and, and sometimes even meeting with family. Um, I've thought th that it reminds me a little bit of the Apostle Paul. I'm a Bible teacher, so it's going to do that. Um, but the Apostle Paul, he traveled around starting these churches and then leaving them behind and traveling miles away, wishing that he could be back with the people that he was with. Um, and his Zoom account wasn't working. Um, I don't think his internet was working either. And so he had to resort to taking some parchment and a quill and maybe having some people help and writing letters to connect with these people. Um, and that's where we have most of the books at the end of our New Testament, Paul's epistles or letters. And uh, one of these letters he wrote was to a small group of Christians in the Macedonian city of Philippi, uh, the book of Philippians. And I think that this book has a lot of insights that are really appropriate and relevant for what we're celebrating today. And so I want to walk us through um, several of the ideas in the book of Philippians. Again, I'm a Bible teacher, so that's what we're going to do with the graduation speech. Um, I'm going to start in verse 3. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Um, Paul looked at these Philippian Christians from a distance and said, whenever I think about you, I am thankful and joyful. And I want you, class of 2020, to know that we, as a staff, as teachers, we think about you often. We pray for you often. And when we do, we are thankful and we are joyful because you have been a very special class. As we look back over the year, there are so many moments that bring me thankfulness, bring me joy, uh, many of them with some of you as individuals. Um, and more than that, we are proud of you. We are proud um, because especially this year, you've accomplished so much. Obviously, this year uh, did not end the way that any of you expected it would end, and that brought a lot of difficulty. Um, it's brought a lot of difficulty to some of you in very real ways. It's meant the loss of a lot of things, but you made it, you endured, and we are so proud of you as a school for doing that. And it wasn't always easy. There was some grumbling along the way probably at times, but you made it, and we are so very proud of you, and we're proud because we wanted you to make it to this point because we love you so much, and when I say we love you, we love you as a class, but as I say I love you, I'm thinking of individual people, individual faces that I just have so many good memories of, and, and I love, and the teachers, we love you, and so we are thankful for you. Paul said that he was thankful for them because of their partnership in the gospel. Um, but at this point in your time at Westside, you should know that the gospel means good news. Um, and hopefully at this point, you also know that that good news is not good news about abstract ideas about forgiveness and salvation and, and whether God exists or not. The good news is, is good news about a story. In fact, the good news is the story. The gospel is a story. And this story begins way back at creation when God created the world, and we've talked about this a lot in class, he created image bearers that were created and intended to reflect his image, to be like he is so that they would rule this world in such a way that it brings peace, shalom, everything working as it should. And this story, this gospel story, continues on till we get to Jesus, who came and he was the exact reflection of God. And so not only did he show us what it is like to be an image bearer, but through his death, he provided the means so that we could become image bearers. Um, Paul is talking about a story, and this gospel is a story. Now, each of us, we often think of live our lives as a story. Our life is a story. And so graduation is a time where you are moving on with your stories and you're going on to your individual stories of life as you move on from Westside. Um, 
And we often think of the world that way, as all these people living out their stories, your story and my story. Uh, we could write a biography of my story. It wouldn't be interesting or exciting, but it would be my story. Um, I think of if we were to go to an improv studio, and at the improv studio, every actor on the stage was each given a, a different role to play, but also given a different story to be a part of. One is a science fiction story, one's a romance story, one's a comedy, one's a survival story. And they're all on the stage, all playing out their stories. And from the audience, it would look like chaos as they're all doing their own things. And every once in a while, they would probably interact with each other and they'd bump into each other. Uh, but even that would be chaos because each would just be using the other story as a part of their story. And from the audience, it might be entertaining for a while, but it would start to just kind of be empty. And in our world, we see everyone having their own stories, and sometimes we bump into each other's stories, but it's just so that we can use their story as a part of our story. And so here at Westside, we're gonna move on with our stories, you're gonna move on with your stories, and you've been a part of our stories, we've bumped into each other for a while. But uh, it starts to feel a little meaningless when we see the world that way, uh, because it's empty. As we live out these individual stories, uh, there's not a lot of purpose to it. And so uh, people often, they try to find meaning for their story, and so they grab onto a cause. Um, it might be uh, justice, or it might be patriotism, or it might be humanitarianism, it might just be hedonism, but we jump onto something and go, I'm going to try to find my meaning in this, but even those are just individual stories that sometimes bump into each other and use each other and ultimately don't provide meaning. Paul here provides a different vision, a vision that he says, this is what truly brings meaning and purpose and true community. He says everything is folded up into one grand story, the story of the gospel. The gospel is the story that all of us live in. We're not living individual stories. We are all parts in one story. And in fact, Paul says we're partners in this story. There's one story, and all of us are in that, and we can be partners in this story. That's Paul's vision. The Philippians were partners in this story with Paul by giving to him financially, providing for him, sending people to him to help support him and encourage him and take care of his needs. But more importantly, they participated in the gospel by living out the reality of the gospel in their own city, by working to see that they reflect God's image better so that their world becomes more like the shalom, the peace world that God wants. And as they do that, they partner with Paul in the gospel. And so because of that, he's thankful and rejoices. Um, here at Westside, we are part in the story. We're going to move on. We're going to uh, work with next year's class and the next generation. And you're going to move on to college or to, to work or to travel, wherever you go. And your part in the story will move on. But are still, we're still part of the same story. We're still partners in the same story. And this story gives meaning and purpose because this story is moving towards something. This story is moving towards something. And so all of us that play a part in this story are moving towards that purpose. And that gives everything we do purpose and meaning. And it ties us together in this. We're all part of the same story, class of 2020. Um, and then we're doing this as Paul says, to bring everything to completion. Paul says, I am confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Um, this story has an ending. God has a way that this is all going to end, and everyone's going to play their part in this to bring it to the completion that God wants. And Paul was confident that the Philippian church as a church would bring to completion what God wants, they would play their role in this story. And we as a staff are confident that your class will play the role that God wants to bring his great story of the gospel to the good completion that he wants. We can have confidence that you will play your role. And that gives your life moving on from here such great purpose. So what was Paul's part in this story? Paul traveled around starting churches, but at this point in the story, his part in the story was to be in prison. He was in prison in Rome, uh, awaiting a trial from Caesar himself, and he knew that he would likely be killed. He might stay alive, he might die, but that's the role he was playing right now. And these Philippian Christians, because they loved him so much, they sent word to him. They wanted to know, how are you doing? Are you suffering? Are your needs being taken care of? Are people looking after you? Are you really going to die at the end of this? 
And so Paul wrote this letter in response, and his letter was, you want to know how I'm doing? He says in verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He says, you want to know how I'm doing, and to you that means what's going on in my life? Am I suffering? Am I hurting? What's going to happen? But I want to tell you, when you ask what's happening in my life, my answer is I'm playing my role in the story. The gospel is advancing. That's what matters. Yes, I'm hurting. Yes, I'm suffering. But the story is moving towards its completion like it should. So I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And he goes on in verse, uh, in later verses to say, and because of this, I will rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. He says, I am playing exactly the part I'm supposed to play, and so it is a cause for rejoicing. And as you move forward in life, you're going to play the part that God has as you advance the gospel if you say that's what matters, and that is a cause for rejoicing when you are exactly where God wants you to be in life. A time to rejoice. Um, He even goes on and says in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. He says, I I might die at the end of this. I might live. I really don't know. But what matters is that Christ will be exalted. And we so much for you as a class want you to see Christ exalted in your life. Whatever happens, that is what is so valuable to us. In fact, Paul uh, joins with them and says in verse 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul says, you guys, you know I'm struggling, but your questions about my suffering come because you yourselves are suffering. Um, In that day and age, Likely they were suffering financially and socially because they wouldn't join in with the worship of the emperor and worship of their, uh, the gods of their guilds, and so they were hurt financially. They were hurt socially. They were ostracized and persecuted. And Paul says, I know you're suffering. I know you are hurting too. Um, we have been hearing a lot over the past few months that we're living in unprecedented times. Um, and in terms of, of the exact things that are happening, and especially the global scale, this is an unprecedented time. But we've talked about in class how when we talk about groups of people suffering with no way of seeing how to get out, that's happened throughout history. In the first centuries of the Christian church, the church was persecuted and suffering, and they said there's no way out and we're hurting. Um, we see later in Europe with the plague and, and everything seems to be coming to an end. Uh, we see Ebola outbreaks and, and famine and drought in countries in Africa. There have always been groups of people that have been hit hard by some kind of suffering. And Paul says, we did this in the first time. And so groups of people suffering and hurting and not getting to see what their future is going to be and being uncertain, that is definitely not unprecedented. And so as we go through that, we're in a long history of people that have done that. And what does Paul say? He says, it has been given to you as a gift that you should be able to suffer for him. That sounds ridiculous. Why is it a gift that we could suffer for Christ? Well, I, I think part of it's because he sees this life as a story. It's a story, and in all good stories, the hero of the story goes through heartache. He goes through a period of time where it looks like nothing can happen. I can't get out of this. There's no way out of this. That's what makes a good story. And in fact, in this story, that's what the hero does. Jesus is the hero of our story, and he suffered immensely. And he says, I've given as a gift to you that you don't have to be a character in the story on the margins, on the sidelines, sitting back. You get to participate in my suffering. You get to be right in the center of the action because that's where growth happens. That's where everything's happening. That's where the story's moving forward. So it's a gift that you get to participate with me in this. And then he expands on this idea in chapter 2. And we've spent a lot of time in class on this chapter, so hopefully you're familiar with it. He says in chapter 2, your thinking should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to for his own advantage. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The hero of this great gospel story 
is Jesus, and this is what he has done, and this is what it means to reflect the image of God. Uh, oftentimes we, we look at the Old Testament father and we see that's this God that's in it for himself and he's judgmental and just, and then there's Jesus who is loving and kind. But this passage says the son was in the very nature of God. He is God. He's exactly what God is like. And because of that, he didn't hold on to the status of that. He didn't hold on to it for his own advantage, but he let it go and became nothing. When he did that, he was showing us exactly what the father is like. That is what the God, the author of the story is like. He's a self-giving God who says, I'll become nothing for your sake because I love you and I'm going to even be obedient and die for you. What does it look like to reflect the image of God, to be the image bearers we were made to be? It looks like this, because this is what God the Father looks like. He looks like what Jesus looked like on this earth. That is what this world is about. That is what our role in the story is about. As you move on from here, your role in life, if the gospel is the true story of the world, is to reflect God's image, and to reflect God's image is to become nothing to become a servant of all, to be obedient and humble, even if it means death. Um, graduations are often seen as this great milestone, a stepping stone where we've prepared you to go out in the world to be doctors and lawyers and salespeople and business people and teachers and, and social workers and whatever it is, and you're going to start moving up in success because we've prepared you to go launch out and be everything that you can be. Um, at the end of first semester, we, I had you guys make timelines projecting out what your life might look like. And so many of you knew exactly what would happen right away. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a, a job. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have this job. And then, and then it was just kind of like, and then I'll, I don't know what I'll do. I'll do something for the next 40 years, and then I'll die, because that's kind of what you do. And that's the story our world has given us. We're all living our own story, so we go be what we're going to be, and we climb up the ladder, and we do that. But the gospel story gives us a different story. The gospel story says, we have prepared you for something different. This school and everything it is, this graduation time is time for you to move out and not become doctors and lawyers. That, that's secondary. We have prepared you to go out and become nothing. We've prepared you to go out and be servants to everyone. We have tried to prepare you so that you could in humility love others greater than yourself and be obedient to God. And for some of you, that role will include being doctors and lawyers and other things, but that is not what matters. What matters is that you fulfill the role that you were created to be, which is reflecting the image of God. And that's what we want so desperately for you after you walk out of this building. So what does this look like in practical terms? Well, Paul goes on in verse 14. He says, do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. He says, I want you Philippian Christians to shine like stars because the world you're in is dark, it's bleak. And he uses a lot of Old Testament imagery here from both Deuteronomy and from the book of Daniel. And you guys know that I'd love to spend time exploring that. But for time's sake, I'll let you explore that on your own. Let's just look at what Paul is saying here. He's saying, this world is bleak and dark, but you can shine like stars. You can stand out so greatly against the darkness of this. And I don't want to be a pessimist. Uh, there is some good in our world. This, but the reality is there's a lot of brokenness and darkness, and all you have to do is turn on the news to see that. But you guys have the chance to go out and shine like stars against that backdrop. And how do you do it? Paul says, by doing everything without complaining or arguing. Again, if you turn on the news today, you will see that by not complaining or arguing, you will stand out and shine like stars, because that's all anyone's ever doing these days is complaining and arguing. And why is complaining and arguing, not complaining and arguing, doing this? Because complaint and argument comes out of this need to drive our own story forward, to advance, to, to make things good for us, to make sure we're known and our ideas are put forth as the best. But if we are truly playing our role, reflecting God's image, becoming nothing, saying your needs are greater than mine, then what's there to complain about? Nothing. I don't need to press in my own advantage forward because I care about you and I love you. 
And so when we don't complain or argue, we become like stars shining in the universe. Um, verse 16 goes on to say, and as you do this, you will hold on to the word of life. You'll hold on to the word of life. This is how you'll shine like stars. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we talked about guarding the deposit that's been entrusted to you. Uh, all of the teaching, all of the learning that you have been given at this school to guard it as you go on. He's saying the same thing here. Grasp on to the word of life. You are going to move out into a dark world. Some of you are going to have professors that are really smart, and they're going to tell you all of the reasons why this word, the gospel story, is not the true story of the world. And they're going to be very persuasive. And some of you will say, that makes sense. I don't know if this is the word of life. Some of you are going to look around and see other people professing to be Christians that are hypocrites. And you're going to say, how can the word of God be the true story of the world when these people act like that? Some of you are just going to be overwhelmed with the injustice in the world. And you say, if this world is this broken and this hurt, how can it be a good story? How can that be the true story of the world? And some of you are going to be the victims of the hurt and pain of this broken world. Some of you already are. And it's not just that you see justice out there, but that injustice has come in and ripped your heart apart. And you're saying, if I hurt so much, how can this be the real story of this world? And Paul doesn't try here to argue that you can have lots of good persuasive arguments or that uh, all Christians are going to act the way they should, or that justice and your cause will finally happen, or, or that you'll never hurt. He doesn't do that. He just says, cling to this word, because it is the word that brings life. This story actually brings life, and if you're counting on the other stories the world provides, you're going to lose out. If you're counting on your intellect and having the right arguments, they're going to fail you. If you're counting on other Christians, uh, they're going to fail you. We, as a staff, I'm sure, have failed you at times already. If you're counting on your cause that will find justice this way, that's going to fail you. And if you're counting on happiness and comfort in this life, it's going to fail you. The word of life, the story of the gospel, is the only thing that truly brings life. It's the thing that you can cling to when you go out from these walls. Not to us, not to anything, but the word of life. Cling to it, because that is where you'll find life in this world. Paul continues on. And he says, shine like stars in the universe, holding on to the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul says, uh, he uses a couple metaphors here. He says running. I don't want to run. If someone runs a race and runs and runs and runs and then doesn't win, it's for nothing. We have a lot of people that have trained a long time to be in the Olympics, and they've worked hard and run and run. And then the Olympics were canceled, and it seems like it's for nothing. Or to labor for nothing. Back in Paul's day, they would have labored very hard at, at physical jobs that would have tired them out. Paul would have been making tents that might have caused his hands to be arthritic. People would be digging and building. And you dig and you build and you, and you make stuff for a long time and your body hurts. And then you get to the end and they say, there's no paycheck. And, and what you built fell down. You built for nothing. Paul says, I don't want that to be the case. I have labored on your behalf so that you could live out your role in this story. And when we get to the end, when all is said, and done, I want to boast that you've played your role. See, Paul is still saying we're partners in this. Everything, even when we get to the end and how things come to me at the end of all time, is tied up together with you. Uh, we are working together on this, and what happens to me in the end is dependent on what you do and what happens to you, and vice versa. When it comes to the gospel, we are truly all in this together. We're partners in this because it's one story with one good end. In class of 2020, we at Westside, we're going to continue our role working with other people. You're going to continue your role, but we're in this together. And even if we never physically see each other again, our fates are, are bound up together with your fate, and your fates are bound up together with ours. And we want you to shine like stars so that our labor and your parents' labor and your pastors' and youth pastors' labor has not been in vain. And what does it all end with? Paul says, and when it comes to the end, 
I will rejoice and rejoice with you, and you will rejoice and rejoice with me. There's going to be great rejoicing together. But why rejoicing? If this story is a story about a hero that becomes nothing and suffers and dies, and then he calls us to be like him and join with him in his suffering and dying, how is that cause for rejoicing? Well, because this is a good story. And the best stories have a good ending. And this story has the best ending. Back in Philippians 2, where it says Jesus would become obedient to death, even death on a cross. It goes on and says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He says this story ends when Jesus is Lord and everything is made right. He rules in such a way that peace and harmony return, and this world is made the way that it's supposed to be. This is how this story comes to a completion. That is the end of the gospel story. And what's more, Paul says this. He says uh, later in chapter 3, he says, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings, and I want to become like him in his death so that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. And then later he says, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything uh, under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Not only will we see an end where everything is made as it's supposed to be and all of the heartache and all of the bad arguments and all of the hypocrisy and all of the injustice and all of the hurt and pain, all of that will be gone and made right. But not only that, but the hero of the story be glorified and we who have partnered with him will share in his glory because we have participated in his suffering as well. We get to end this story in great, great glory with the Lord of all reigning over everything. That's the story you're graduating out into. That's the story that you get to go live out. And that's the good ending that has been promised that we can have confidence that God will bring to completion. You guys have graduated. You're moving on to this part of the world And we want to encourage you that we're still part of the same story. We're still partners in the gospel. And so as teachers, as parents, as staff, and I'm sure your pastors and youth pastors would also be in on this, we want to encourage, we want to urge you to play your role in this story, to go and reflect the image of God by becoming like the hero of this story, the one who best reflects the image of God. Go and become nothing. Go and become a servant of all, loving people so that their needs are more important than your own. Go and obediently hang on to God and hold on to the word of God so that you shine like stars in the universe. And when you do that, we can look forward to a day, someday, when we all get together and rejoice together because none of us have labored in vain. That's the future that's waiting for you. I want to end by praying the prayer that Paul prayed for the Philippians back in chapter 1. He says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Many of you have already been playing your role well. You have been partners in the gospel. I could go on for another hour with stories of how some of you individually have encouraged me, have challenged me, have caused me to think better, have brought humility to me, have allowed me to share uh, deep things. You've been friends to me. You're already partners in the gospel. And so we ask you to keep being partners in the gospel. Class of 2020, go out and shine like stars. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you. 
We adore you when we receive and enjoy the many blessings you bestow upon us. We also adore you when we go through challenging times as we all have experienced recently. We confess our need for you and pray this confession is not isolated to this one moment, but is a continued confession for a lifetime. We confess our sins to you. You alone are holy and righteous, and we are those who desperately need your righteousness. So we give you thanks that you imparted to us your righteousness through Christ. Collectively, the teachers, administration, parents, and friends ask that you watch over this class. Guide them and lead them. These next years can be some of the most challenging years, and we anticipate that you will remain the good, great, and chief shepherd in their life as many around them will express a need to experience the things in this world, I pray that this class will echo the heart response of the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. We commit their souls into your hands. We trust that the work you have done in their heart during these years at Westside, if it has not already come to fruition, will come to fruition. Your word, God, never returns void. Your words are creative. We pray that this class would be creative. Your words are comforting. We pray that this class brings comfort to the brokenhearted. Your words are pure and right. We pray this class remains pure in heart. Your words sustain. We pray this class would bring sustaining power wherever they go. Your words give life. I pray this class brings life and joy with them. You, Jesus, are the very word of God. I pray this class follows you and you alone. We pray against the desire of the enemy to bring destruction in their life. We pray that his plans are thwarted. Jesus, our great God and Savior, we love you and desire to know you more clearly for the rest of our days. May this desire to know you remain foremost in these graduates' hearts. In your name we pray. Amen.
summer glue.
Hello there. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> Thank you so much.
I've got the goods. All Can right. You come on? Congratulations, Dave. Davis Martin Raz. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's great to meet you. You too. Yeah. Lucas Jeffrey Walter. Morris Prosper Duopu. Come on up, baby. Congratulations, Woo! Morris. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations, man. Turning that way. You don't want to wear your hat or your motorboard. Testing again. What? Got it? One more time. Good. Oh, we're good. Thank you. Joseph David Fruhoff. Rebecca Ann Gurney. Congratulations. Normally I'd shake your hand, but I'm going to let you walk over to Mr. Hines. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Mr. Hines. Nice to meet you. Okay. Look this way. Again, one more time. Eyes open. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Gabriel Isaiah Askew. Maggie Louise Souter. Congratulations, Maggie. Normally I'd shake your hand, but I'll just let you walk over to Mr. Hines. Congratulations, Maggie. Elizabeth Joy Longacre. Ethan Jinsup Chung. Kaylee Janelle Becker. Isabella Lily McMahon. Christopher David Gordon. Congratulations, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. There we go. Good. Again, one more time. Congratulations. Maxwell James Murphitt. Sophie Lee Collins. Congratulations, Sophie. Hi, Sophie. Congratulations. 
Chloe Danielle Bratton. Lauren Rose Damaris. Joseph Michael Gatea. Olivia Faye Stevens. Logan Davis Washburn. Kayla Grace Wooten. Grace Eileen Vermillion. Jenna Corinne Ellis. Tian Xiang Chen. Sean Alec O'Leary. Emma Jane Phillips. Sung Wu Kang. Peter Mark Nordland. Iran Hu. Claire Elizabeth Shear. Lily 
Grace Shearer. Melody Cielo Pereira. Taylor Sage Folio. Paige Alexandra Bolin. Kira Noel Hardigan. Quinn Nu Le Win. Sean Robert Thomas. Deanna Bricker. Henry Dodd Golson. Samantha May Lepresti. Kara Klein Tully. Alvin Fan Lai. Dwayne Lamar scales the second. Rachel Dawn Holtgren. Brooklyn Danielle Rodriguez. Noah Kelly Pratt.
May you have auspiciousness and causes of success. May you have the confidence to always do your best. May you take no effort in your being generous. Sharing what you can, nothing more, nothing less. May you know the meaning of the word happiness. May you always lead from the beating in your chest. May you be treated like an esteemed guest. May you get to rest, may you catch your breath. May the best of your todays be the worst of your tomorrows. Whoa. May the road less paved be the road that you follow. Whoa. Well, here's to the hearts that you're gonna break. Here's to the lives that you're gonna change. Here's to the infinite possible ways to love you. May you keep the chaos and the clutter off your desk. May you have unquestionable health and less stress. Having no possessions, though immeasurable wealth. May you get a gold star on your next test. May your educated guesses always be correct. And may you win prizes shining like diamonds. May you really own it each moment to the next. Or may the best of your todays be the worst of your tomorrows. Whoa. Or may the road less be the road that you follow oh. well here's to the hearts that you gonna break here's to the lives that you gonna change here's to the infinite possible ways to love you If you believe it, then anything can happen. Go, 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 raise your glasses. Go, 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 you can have it all. Oh. I told you, here's to the hearts that you're going to break. Here's to the lives that you're going to change. Here's to the infinite possible ways to love you. it all.